is. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Laurel Hall. I work out of the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. I've been working um, there for in behavioral research for probably about nine years now, focusing on uh, uh, drug addiction and HIV and the behaviors that interact between them. Um, for the most part, I've been working under epidemiology and public health, although I took a couple years in the psych psychiatry department. And uh, the last couple years, or actually three years, I've been working mainly on CTN and CTN-based projects um, as a uh, coordinator of retention and recruitment um, and really keeping a focused eye on planning those, on maintaining those, and doing a lot of problem solving and brainstorming um, on how to uh, make those better. So that's what this is about, the things that I've learned over the past couple years. Um, any questions are absolutely welcome. Any comments are absolutely welcome. Um, throughout the uh, presentation, we've put on a few slides a large red question mark in the lower right-hand corner of the slide. So if you'd like to take notes of any questions or comments that you have and wait for one of those slides, that'll be a natural place where I'll open up for questions to come. And as the moderator had said uh, to do that, you would press star one. All right. To begin with, um, we'd like to get an idea of who everybody is who's on this call. So I have a, a poll question for you. And Liz, if you can go to the first one. Um, I'd like to know how involved you are in recruitment and retention planning. So um, if you're not involved at all, this is something that's completely new to you, or currently you just do not work in recruitment and retention planning. If you're involved in a site-specific level, perhaps you're an RA or a counselor, maybe you are a um, site PI or a site coordinator. If you're involved on a project-wide level, maybe you work in a node or on the lead team, um, something that's going between sites and helping with overall coordination. And maybe you're involved in all planning levels, so both site-specific and project-wide. That's something that I do because I work as a liaison between all the different levels. So we'll give everybody a chance to fill those in. And if anybody has any sort of questions about where you fit in, um, please let me know. Again, you ask questions by pressing star one. I'm going to give it just a moment for them to populate, and then I'll um, show the polling results. Great. And at this time, we do have a question or comment. Please go ahead. Yes? And your line is open. Please go ahead. Caller, you may want to check your mute button. Your line is open. If you're on a speakerphone, we're unable to hear you. Please pick up the handset or check your mute button. Okay, and we're not hearing a response at this time, but again, that is a reminder, star one, to pose a question or make a comment. And no one else is in the queue at this time. All right, Lil, let's go ahead and um, show the results. Great. I'm going to close the polls and show the results. Okay, there you go, Lil. Okay, great. Um, so we've got uh, a small number of people who are not involved at all, um, equal amounts, slightly more, who are on the project-wide level, um, perhaps node or lead teams, as well as all planning levels, so working between different levels. And then the majority of people are on site-specific levels. So this is really great because we can get down into real details about how um, site research teams can plan for uh, procedures um, before their projects start, how to do recruitment and retention, um, really down to details. And that's, that's part of what I want to do today. So um, thanks, everybody, for, for answering those questions. Liz, we had one other question, correct? Sure. Here you go. 
Okay. So our next one is how much are you involved in the implementation of recruitment and retention? And again, we've got not involved at all. Um, implementing procedures, so this I'm thinking would be counselors or RAs. You're actually running recruitment and interventions. Um, coordinating and problem solving on a site-specific level. Uh, this would be um, PIs, uh, site coordinators, perhaps um, other types of managers and maybe lead RAs, um, coordinating and problem solving on a project-wide level. Again, this I'm really referring to nodes uh, and coordinating implementation, implementing protocol changes. And this I'm really thinking of um, project-wide PIs, lead teams, people who are making the ultimate decisions that trickle down to the site team. And again, we'll, we'll uh, give everybody a chance to um, uh, vote in on who they are. And if you're in a group, um, maybe just the majority of everybody who's there um, would want to be represented that way so we can tailor this, this presentation to as many people who are listening in as possible. show the results and people can you know still put their answers in. Okay, great. Okay, Laurel, I think we have them all in. Awesome. All right. So again, uh, we've got um, a few people that are not involved at all um, in implementing recruitment and retention, um, implementing procedures about a third of everybody. So I'm guessing we've got quite a few people who are involved um, directly with patient and client contact. Uh, we've got about just under half of everybody who coordinate and problem solve on a site-specific level. So I mean, I guess maybe quite a few managers, site coordinators, um, and a few site PIs on there. So welcome everybody, and then a few people who are coordinating and problem solving on a project-wide level. So a few um, looking down from on high from the academic point. Uh, again, welcome everybody. Uh, please let me know if I'm not addressing something that really. Uh, is on a level that would work for you if I'm addressing too much towards, say, um, something that would really apply for somebody who's in a no position, but don't say enough about how that point would apply to somebody who's working directly on the floor or at a site, uh, let me know so I can elaborate. And I think we can get started and do a little bit of an outline of to what we are talking about. So um, there's my favorite new picture of me. And here's what we're going to be talking about today. So uh, I don't really need to read through this, but really going through how to build teams, um, how to prepare for recruitment in terms of documentation, team building, um, really planning out every aspect of what you're going to need to do so everybody is clear and has a clear resource for things like that, uh, the different ways to approach uh, preparing for study follow-up, and then going through and implementing study follow-up, um, addressing the needs for the needs and solutions for uh, addressing barriers, um, again, working collaboratively, team building, and finally, uh, some tools, both traditional and non-traditional, for um, doing all of these things, okay? All right, I'd like to start off with team building, and it's sort of a cliche, but um, when research happens or any sort of work happens, you really want to build a rapport with everybody that you're working with. And when it comes to doing off-site research, that means building a rapport at every single level. Um, one thing that you can sort of 
make it make it sound like is if you consider rapport to be contagious. If you've got a good reputation and a good relationship with one person, they can influence how you're seen by everybody on their level or in their environment um, as if, you know, it is contagious, like a cold. They can say, you know what, that team, that research team, they're really doing a good job by me, so give them a chance. Um, particularly when we're working in, uh, say, medical environments, sometimes those teams work together so through a lot of stress, through a lot of tight staffing, tight timing, tight budgeting, it can become fairly insular and uh, close to outsiders. And so it's really important to build trusting relationships with, um, with site staff that you're working with, either in a clinic or a drug treatment center or something like that. Um, the, the way that, that you can do that on an organizational level is um, identify the person who knows what's going on at the site, who can help to understand what your study is about, how you need to fit in, and what sorts of what reasons you are at that particular site and how to fit your staff in. Um, that means, say, at a clinic or in a doctor's office, it may be the head nurse or someone who's in charge of scheduling and space allocation. That person has the power, and you want to be on that person's good side and make life not more difficult for him or her. All right, so identify that person, make sure that he or she knows what your needs are, and also knows that you are interested in that person's needs and continuing to run their environment smoothly. Um, you'll need to know what staff you're going to be working with in that environment, who's going to help you uh, connect with clients, such as a receptionist, an RN, or some other nurse, a physician's assistant, maybe an intake counselor or a drug treatment counselor. Um, who's going to hook you up with potential participants? Are you going to be able to approach them on your own within your staff, or do you need to have a hook between the clinic staff, um, the, the site staff, and your research staff? And how will you fit that need into that person's job so that you're not putting an extra burden on them? Um, whose workspace will you be sharing? Because you are invading their environment. Whose equipment will, will you be using? Will you be sharing computers, sharing lab space? Will you be bringing in equipment that, that, that will benefit their staff um, so that, uh, you're, again, you're putting the less burden on them and making it a pleasant or at least not a negative experience for them to work with research staff? Um, whose services will you be using? Will you be using a phlebotomist or physicians or nurses to conduct some of your research activities? You need to know who these people are and work individually with them. Let them know, this is what we need. How can we make it fit into what you already do so as to minimize interference? All right? And finally, on the upper level, PI and director level, um, that's site PI, lead team PI, as well as node PI, and the site director, um, whatever their title is, need to work together and have a really good working relationship. Um, it needs to be friendly and collaborative, and ideally we're looking at a relationship that can resolve top-level conflicts or barrier reduction issues um, on a very rare basis when it can't be solved from the staff that, are, uh, that they are overseeing. All right, but you don't want to bother the director of a clinic too much because he or she has too much going on, but you do want to have that relationship in place already so that if there is an issue where, um, say, clinic staff are really not following through with connecting their clientele to the research staff to be screened, then you need the message to come from on high in a staff meeting at the clinic saying, guys, I know this is extra work, but I really need you to follow through because we've agreed to work with this team, okay? So that's really what I mean by building rapport with all levels of each team and making sure that you know how you're going to fit in, all right? And 
definitely listening to the team whose space and whose environment and whose work schedules you're going to be interfering with to let them know you want it to be a pleasant experience. We'll move on. Um, again, knowing your staff, knowing uh, who is working on what, um, I needed to bring up bridging the gap between theory and field experience. There's a really wide range of who comes on to a project when you're going between the academic environment and um, social services or medical facilities. Um, some people have gone through schooling that forces them to know quite a bit about research. Some people have been involved in research for years. Some people are coming straight from the CTN, so this is exactly what they do, um, while others may have been uh, either hired onto the project specifically for their skills but have no prior research experience, or they may have been working in the field at the site for decades but, uh, but really don't have the practical experience with research. So you really need to understand who knows what and have ongoing education regarding what you're trying to do there, um, why you're trying to do it, and how that fits in with what the site and environment is doing, okay? One of the things that I found helpful when I start out in explaining how I want people to, um, to conceptualize a project is making sure that everybody on every level understands the, vo the value of follow-up retention rates and of recruiting an appropriately uh, representative population. I explain to them internal validity and external validity, making sure that who you have and who you keep in the study um, has enough diversity so that you can compare them to each other and enough similarity to compare them to each other, as well as being able to compare them to the general population, both in that environment and perhaps nation or worldwide, and making sure that those concepts are clear for everybody, not assuming that either nobody knows about them or assuming that everybody knows about them is really key. Um, knowing that, uh, making sure that everybody understands what the study outcomes are, and this is not just the site team and staff, this is your research team. Um, if you've brought on, uh, say, PIS workers or um, phlebotomists or uh, drug treatment counselors, uh, making sure that, um, you know, maybe the protocols uh, quite a bit to slog through when they're going through all the training. So we want to make sure that everybody knows exactly what the aims of the study are and how we're going to address that and accomplish finding those outcomes out. Um, sometimes uh, when we're working in the social services environment, um, you can come across sort of uh, some difficulties in understanding the difference between um, treatment as usual and uh, denying a client services. If we're trying a new intervention, um, sometimes people who are in human services areas, uh, we've been working for decades on helping people in whatever way we can with all the resources that we can. And if I'm working as a counselor and I've been doing that for 30 years, Sometimes I might feel that I'm doing a disservice to my client by not offering them as much as I know. And if I know about this new intervention and I d instinctively feel that it's a good thing, it's going to be very difficult for me to deny my client offering that service. So making sure that, uh, that everybody on the team at the site understands that treatment as usual is not a disservice to clients and the reason why we need to clarify the difference between uh, treatment as usual and a new treatment is very important and is an ongoing process to prevent um, uh, any sort of slide in applying the protocol. And finally, it's really good for people to understand why their skill sets in particular are valuable for, uh, for working on a project and how the research team needs to apply those. Um, why is a counselor really valuable in 
conducting a certain intervention um, or another project? What sorts of skills are applicable and how are they applicable? Do we need to change how we're conceptualizing and reframe a certain skill so we're applying it in a very di uh, different way, um, but in a way that 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 staff member understands and understands um, the similar similarities and the differences. Are there certain skills that that facilitator or that counselor or interventionist um, need to keep an eye on and keep rein back so that they don't interfere with the protocol? Okay, we'll move on. Um, we have a poll. All right. So uh, we've just been talking about teams and about what types of people are working and how to address different ideas about them. So I want to know, what are your teams like? Um, and if it's a current team that you're thinking about, or teams in general, if you tend to do the same sort of work. Um, research and academic, is your team purely working on the academic side and you go into um, sites to work? Are you treatment providers, such as um, drug treatment facilities, um, shelters, something like that, medical services, and I apologize for the typo there, or providers? Uh, are you working in a physician's office, a hospital, um, some, some other type of medical facility? Mental health or social services, are you caseworkers? Are you um, counselors, um, and maybe even uh, specific group counselors, drug treatment counselors outside of a, a purely drug treatment setting, and maybe we have some other people who don't really fall into those categories, and I'd actually like to hear if there's somebody who feels that they really don't fall into those because it'd be interesting to know um, some other environments I might need to keep in mind while I'm doing this presentation. We'll give another minute so that everybody can figure out where they think they fall in. I'm going to go ahead and show the poll results, but the polls will remain open for responses. Okay, go for it. So it looks like um, the majority of people really consider themselves originating in the research and academic field. I'm guessing this, these are um, the research teams and facilitators that, that go into the sites and work with the participants. We've got a small um, number of treatment providers, um, so I'm guessing maybe some phlebotomists, physicians, uh, counselors that come from the sites themselves or maybe work between, all right, and a couple from the other places that I mentioned. Okay, so we can go back to the slides, Liz? Sure. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, um, as I move on, uh, another thing to really prepare for in terms of team building is knowing how and when to communicate. And this can seem like um, quite a bit of communication when you're doing multiple sites across the country, multiple teams, and it can really bog people down in, uh, you know, getting 75 billion emails a day, having five different conference calls throughout the week. Um, a lot of team meetings that are in person, and really balancing that out, but making sure that there's constant communication so everybody stays connected. One thing that's pretty clear in the CTN is that it, it really is structured on a number of levels um, that is far more complex than a one-site one research um, facility, all right? And so you need to remember that um, teams can become isolated, so it's really important to have regular communication with your research team, with the clinic or other site staff, and regular team meetings between different levels and different locations so that not only can you share ideas and share troubles, but you can brainstorm potential barriers and potential solutions before they happen, while they're happening, before they come to a head, or if there's an emergency. So everybody stays on the same page. One other way to, um, uh, to ensure clear communication is clear documentation of interactions with participants, of how everything is moving. 
so that anybody on any level can start to identify patterns and problems before they become impossible to solve. Um, and, and identifying those patterns and problems can be a way to indicate possible need for protocol adjustments, for clarification within the manuals of operations, for possible um, amendments to the protocol to submit to IRBs, um, as well as uh, predicting different uh, future interactions with participants or uh, future interactions in certain stages of the project. Um, and then you can use all of those patterns that you've identified, all those predictions that you have, brainstorm with all the different levels of staffing and teams, and target appropriate strategies, um, utilizing everybody's skills. So you've got your people who work on the street, in the clinic, day by day, face to face with participants, as well as those who have a really good eye and a lot of experience for the overarching picture of how a project is structured, take those really disparate experiences and bring them together and come up with some viable options and bounce them off of each other because it can, as I said, teams can become really isolated from each other and if you make a decision on one level and have it trickle down without consulting that other level, you may find out that once you've um, directed to implement a change, that change doesn't work at all, but you could have known that if there had been more communication going on between levels and between um, locations. Okay, so preparation and tools. I want to talk about preparing to recruit. Um, one of the ways uh, in which preparing to recruit um, is really important is to know what tools you're going to be using, all the tracking forms to be using, and making those as streamlined as possible while also keeping all of the information that you need as easy to access but accurately um, kept track of. So, Tracking forms, um, you need to make sure that in your manuals of operations, you've got examples of locator forms, recruitment logs, um, screenshots of a database and the data entry system you might be using, and really good instructions of how to use them, the requirements for using them. And this can include how do you get uh, access to them? How do you have a username assigned? Um, do you need a special password? who exactly is responsible for entering information in all of these items, all right? And then as every site is unique, um, every site is going to need site-specific recruitment modifications, site-specific um, uh, site uh, manuals of operations that are going to happen, that recognize that environments are unique, we have different spacing, different timing in different clinics and, uh, and different environments, um, you need to know where you're going to recruit at a specific site, and that can't be across the board because no one place is the same. Um, again, gaining access to clients at each specific site is unique. Uh, sites tend to have or can have different IRB requirements if you're not using an overarching IRB. That needs to be in your manual of operations so that anybody who's um, who's consulting it as a resource knows if there's a change to this one thing, does it need to go up to IRB? Who needs to receive it, all right? Who's responsible for entering changes into the site-specific um, manual of operation? Um, how are you going to allocate staff? Are you going to have a different way of distributing staff than the other sites on a project? And you really need to have an organi organization of that very clear and set out. So not only does your team and your site and your node know about it, but that the, the lead team has an idea of how you're going about doing it, can actually use that and compare it to other sites, make suggestions to other sites if they're at a loss or if they're having some problems, all right? A lot of teams end up having a unique approach to how to do recruitment or how to do barrier reduction that end up being very, very helpful to other teams, but they need to have that information put down in a clear way to, sh to share it evenly, all right? 
Um, preparing for recruitment also involves really extensive walkthroughs and role plays, and not just the walkthroughs that you do with your QA monitors so that you decide whether you're ready to launch, but also walkthroughs and role plays consistently um, practicing the material, practicing the timing, practicing moving through the space and where you're going to be storing materials so that everything becomes second nature and you start to identify where specific staff will stumble um, during the procedures. You know, uh, maybe after recruitment and after going through a screening questionnaire, um, I am a, an RA and I always forget to file away somebody's um, somebody's screening questionnaire or I forget to log something in somewhere. So we need to either have a way to remind me to do that and that's clear that I'm not going to miss or I need to practice it more so that I automatically do it or maybe the procedure needs to change. The log needs to change uh, its location so it's easier for me to get to it between activities or the timing of doing the logging needs to change so that it be so that it comes more naturally. Say, I'm much more likely to remember it when I'm doing other paperwork, okay? All right, one of the ways in which to make things easier to remember and to streamline activities and, um, and help teams have a cohesive uh, um, approach to recruitment and to all the activities is to make sure that everybody knows what they're responsible for. And this is something that is to, uh, pretty typically um, handed up to the lead team so that they know that everybody is covering all of the activities. Uh, but it's really helpful for people on site. You know, Knowing what you're responsible for means you know what you're responsible to train for. Uh, we need to know who's doing what who's cross-training because having backup is really essential. Nobody's going to be um, staying for the entire recruitment phase and the entire retention phase without ever being sick, without ever having a family emergency, without ever going on vacation. We're all human, but if something happens and my site coordinator doesn't come in one day, I need to know who's responsible for backing up his activities, all right? If I'm backing up all of his activities, then I need to know what activities those cover. If I'm only backing up some other ones, I need to know who's responsible for the ones I'm not responsible for. So having something like a matrix like this um, helps to make it visual. It's a quick reference, all right? Having it in one of your logs or a manual or even post it up on the wall somewhere just have a quick reference, you know, um, this stuff is going on. Okay, who's responsible for that? Uh, you, you, and you. Um, I need some extra people today, and you're all trained, and I know it, okay? Another reason for cross-training is to give people a break. It's really hard, especially in a high recruitment, high speed pr um, process, to do the same thing day in and day out. You really need to have a break. Um, you need to give your teams a chance to switch things up, to give their brains sometimes their emotions a break if they're doing an intervention that's emotionally taxing, all right? So giving them a chance to do, say, um, some paperwork or some data entry can give them a little bit of time to process their emotions or maybe set them on the back burner um, to give them a, a way to have some quiet downtime while being productive keeps variety going, and it helps with reducing burnout for your staff, which is really, really important. The more you care for your staff, the better that they're going to be able to hold out through the end of uh, a procedure and a protocol, um, because towards the end is where we start to slack off and where we start to not care as much, because we see the light at the end of the tunnel. We just want out, all right? Everybody knows how that feels to be at the end of something. So to keep everything up to the same level of energy it is in the beginning, um, consider as much cross-training as possible so that people can switch each other out, can support each other more. All right, here's another um, visualization. Uh, I like to uh, remember that not only does it make it easier for people if they're rushing around and have very little time to use visual representations of 
um, of different concepts and different ways of structuring because it takes less time. You can train yourself uh, naturally to um, recognize different colors as representing different things. Right here we've got the timing and the spatial organization for um, a protocol we're working on right now. So the blue is any, any activity that requires a semi-private space like an empty hallway, but not complete confidential privacy such as a physician's office. Um, just something away from the crowd so it's unlikely that you'll be overheard. So that would be introduction to the study, um, scheduling and a, a follow-up visit, uh, waiting for test results, you know, giving someone a little bit of space, but it's not required, such as during an actual exam, um, which is the uh, uh, the orange sections in there, where you do need complete privacy so that nobody's going to overhear confidential information. But like I was going back to, these things are color-coded, so at a glance, once I learn this system, I know exactly what blue means, I know what green means, so I know how that corresponds to what's going on in the study. Um, many people are visual learners. It's good to remember that representing information in different ways can, be, can make the entire procedure more efficient for your staff, okay? Um, moving on to another way of organizing this information, and I, I have to say that both of these slides, this slide and the next slide, are something that our local team came up with, and I'm extremely excited to be able to share this with everybody else um, because it's such a great way of uh, having immediate information that is clear to anybody who's not on the staff when it's shown to them. Um, right here we've got just a floor plan that uh, was finagled out of a clinic staff um, scan and then had simple uh, blocks of color put in and those blocks of color um, explained in a key on the right hand side so that you can see what activity would go where and the possibilities for, you'll see that there's a lot of different areas that the STI testing can happen. Um, in all of the exam rooms, in a lab, in the restrooms, um, we've got three different places where an intervention can be run. And that helps because if the clinic is, uh, is overrun one day and have a lot, of, a lot of clients that day, a lot of patients, um, our staff is going to need to know, well, all of the exam rooms are full, but I really need to do STI testing on my participants, so where else do I have available to do it? This is a quick reference that they can post up on the wall, okay? And again, visual representation, color coding is a real quick shortcut once you get used to it. You don't even realize that you're learning it, all right? Um, I want to open up the floor to any questions or perhaps some comments. Um, if anybody has something like this, a different way of representing an organization of a project that they've used or they're planning to use. Um, and again, questions, okay? So we'll give everybody a chance. And again, that's star one if you'd like to make a comment or a question. And as of yet, no one has signaled. Okay, so uh, what I'd like is if you, if it occurs to you later on, please just write it down and in a few slides we'll have another question mark on the slide and you can ask it then or you can comment then. Um, at any time is welcome, so I don't need to, uh, uh, I can handle the interruption at, uh, at any time, so thank you. Um, I'm going to move on to tracking recruitment and retention, which is the main thing that I do, um, and how to prepare for it. Uh, what you need to know is what your resources are. How are you going to track recruitment and retention? Because the closer you track it, the more you can handle immediately any problems. You can foresee any future barriers that are coming up. You can um, prepare for future studies as well as preparing for future um, aspects to the same study, future activities, so moving from uh, recruitment to retention, retention actual follow-up phase. So what programs do you have available? Are you, and, and do you have training in? Um, what's your staff comfortable with? 
Um, it can be as simple as a, an Excel spreadsheet, um, which I've done before. Um, it was a very long one going from side to side and made people catch their breath when they first saw it, but people got used to it, all right? If you're uh, familiar with using databases in MS Access, that's a good way to um, be able to generate reports and queries so that you can come up with faster ways of getting information on the fly. And using just emailed attachments, um, if you've got, uh, say, daily reporting from your teams is something that I've used just to keep track of basic randomization numbers and screening numbers um, when you don't have a centralized platform available. So uh, all of these are, are simple, easy, uh, programs that pretty much everybody has some familiarity with and can pick up any sort of extra snazzy options um, as they go along. Um, what I will be going into more in depth today is customized programming and date for which you need database programmers. And you may already have somebody on staff who can do that, um, somebody who is uh, a data manager themselves and can set up something simple for um, for keeping track of data or who has the time apart from um, doing statistics that can track recruitment and retention for you. Um, you can, for when I said centralized platform, I meant both a database and um, using online access if you've got several different sites that are working simultaneously on a project. What we're doing right now is working on uh, the design of a website that has secure hosting for the database it's connected to um, that allows every member of a research project to enter in their recruitment data and eventually their retention data so that it's almost in real time. Um, by the end of the day, I know what activities have taken place. Um, this is really what I consider to be um, the gold star, the thing to aim for, and the thing to build upon in the future because of its immediacy, because of its um, availability and, uh, and resources that just really speak to user friendliness if you can get a good programmer. But what you need for it is people who are comfortable with web design, people who are comfortable with programming um, connections between uh, databases and web entry, uh, as well as knowing your requirements for storage and transfer of information electronically. That's something very important to make sure that you're upholding HIPAA confidentially confidentiality rules, um, as well as your university's uh, need for door, uh, data storage, all right? But the idea is to keep it user-friendly, having something as easy as it would be as shopping for something on Amazon. Um, it, you know, pretty much anybody can do that a couple clicks of a button, and if you've got that, you've got all the data that you need to track, okay? So and this is where I was going into. Um, who are your website users? Um, on the one hand, we're looking at the site staff, and this is the majority of people who are on this call. So um, people who are uh, taking in the resource, uh, or I'm sorry, the source documents, talking to the participants, and then finally entering in that data in a centralized location. So for, for those of you who are planning on creating something like this, you need to know what your staff's skill set and knowledge level is and how to take advantage of that. Um, you need to set up real life active testing to make sure that you get out bugs. Um, you need to have them testing from the actual documentation that you're using as source documents so that they can notice if there's discrepancies saying, well, this source document is not using the language that you've put in on this and it's going to be confusing for me if I'm trying to go through this at a, hot, at a fast pace. Listen to their requests and opinions before you launch it. What do you need? What's going to make this easier for you? One of the things to take in, into consideration is for some people, entering in information by keypad is really easy and makes things faster and more efficient. So for that, being able to control and um, 
and plan out, say, the tab order or the order in which using the tab button to go from, uh, from item to item on a screen is really important to being able to quickly uh, accomplish data entry with using a keypad, making sure that the coding that you're, that you're using for the answers matches up to the coding that you're using on, say, a screening questionnaire. For others, um, using a mouse is much more important because they really need to look up on the screen and see what's going on. Uh, using the mouse to navigate is easier and more efficient for them given their past experiences, all right? One thing also to consider is what type of equipment are they using outside of keypad versus mouse? Are they using laptops with particularly small monitors? If you're setting up a website, you need to know that it's time consuming and irritating for some people to have to scroll up and down and up and down um, while they're filling out a particular uh, page on a website with the data. Making sure that, say, uh, you have a screen that's set up to represent every page or every couple pages of a source document might make more intuitive sense to somebody than trying to scroll down and down and down and have it all on one page because their monitor is so small, it can't actually encompass the entire entirety of the document in one page. So keeping those things into consideration, testing them out, seeing what irritates and what helps with the process so that it doesn't become another burden on your staff. On the other end of the website are upper level management, end users, um, whoever's going to be uh, helping to design um, liaisoning between the eventual end users and the people who are programming and designing it, um, who are the ones responsible to make sure that the web and the database function in the way that they're supposed to. And that, that's somebody that you need to take into account their skill set and knowledge level as well. Um, can they design a database? Uh, can they manipulate a database? Or do they need to have particular reports and uh, queries set up for them by the programmers of the database so that, um, so that everything can be done at a touch of a button, all right? Um, now, when we're talking about me, um, I'm you, what you would call the stakeholder liaison. I work between uh, the site staff. I work with the, uh, the IT people who are designing and hosting the website and database, as well as with the lead team and the other academic teams around the country. Um, I'm working between all of those people trying to make sure that I can uh, find out what everybody's needs are and see how to incorporate as many of them as possible into the outcome of all of these different systems. All right, so knowing if there is somebody who, like me, um, it's their sole purpose in life inside the office to dedicate to all of this or whether it's going to be spread out between several different people on a project and who's going to be responsible for what, okay? All right, now, um, like I said, the website is the conversion from source documents to the database. Um, and in order to make that happen as quickly as possible, just to re repeat, that the design should mirror the source document as, as much as possible. Um, it needs to uh, create less dissonance, as, as little dissonance as possible between the different systems that uh, your RAs, your counselors, your site coordinators, anybody who's involved on the ground level is going to be using. Um, if, if everything matches up, there's a lot less confusion. You're going to be avoiding errors in data entry, which means later on uh, avoiding data audits and making everybody redo information, all right? Um, the more you can match things up between language, appearance, numbering, um, the better and easier it's going to be for everybody to learn a system. Okay, so again, present things first, do beta testing, make sure that people can see it and say, you know what, this, this doesn't make sense to me, why is this like this? And adjusting it so that it fits everybody or the majority um, to make everything as instinctive uh, to use as possible. 
Okay, so here's an example, and I apologize for the small text on this, but really I wanted you to see the overall format. This is an earlier um, screenshot of the recruitment page for a project I'm working on now, and you'll notice that it's separated into different blocks. So over on the left-hand side, you'll see the important dates. That's a left-hand margin that stays in view no matter what uh, stage of the project um, the viewer, the user, is looking at, whether they're looking at the screening and recruitment mode um, page or tab, as it were, um, whether they're looking at retention tab, the follow-up tab um, that's designed into the website. That left-hand margin is always there, and we've incorporated the six-month um, with follow-up window in there, there's the opening date, the target date, and the closing date that automatically uh, populates. And in later versions, we've added the date of randomization because that's something that's useful to always be able to see. You'll see below that there is a block for adding comments. That's also always visible. Um, and that goes back to documentation of a case, building a case report for every single participant because um, you may not have the same person following every single um, participant, or you may not have the same person following a particular participant throughout the entire study from screening through follow-up. So having a clear history and having comments of that history of this is the last time I contacted the person, or this person, when they screened, they were real squirrely, they wanted to reschedule a whole bunch of times. You need to really look out for them and make sure that you keep track of them pretty, pretty frequently. Um, so that sort of thing will always be over on the left. You can always see the history. The upper main portion of it is all the screening demographic um, information. And you'll notice that um, they're all just big, long, white rectangles. What those are, and there are little arrow boxes to click down, is those expand into um, multiple choice checkbox answers. Um, again, I, I asked for this um, as a space-saving technique because our teams are using laptops that are fairly small so they can be more portable. And having everything expanded out means that they're spending a lot of time using the little mouse pad to scroll back and forth and back and forth. Whereas with this collapsible and expandable design, they can open up what they need to use, close it, and they've still got the rest of the demographic data um, and items visible on their screen. So that's an example of using space saving and knowing your equipment and your users and trying to make it as efficient as possible. Below that, we've got some dates in two different windows. On the left-hand side um, are all of the activities uh, that have due dates and completion dates to fill in uh, for the baseline. Um, and that includes doing the computer baseline, doing the written informed consent form, doing testing, um, what study groups they're part of, uh, uh, exit, view, exit interviews, um, test that medical record abstractions, all of those things that have time limits on them according to the protocol, as soon as the date of randomization is filled in and that record is saved, you'll see that the red dates in there, um, or maybe for those of you on a smaller monitor than I have, we'll see red smudges, but those are dates that automatically populate as soon as the randomization date is entered and the record is saved. And that means that at a glance, um, Anybody who's bringing up that record will know if there is an un in uncompleted activity that the deadline is coming up, all right? And that's a service to the people who are using this so that um, they don't have to calculate that stuff on their own. So it's not in a separate um, source document or program, so it's more centralized for them. And right next to it, you'll have, again, the six-month window, and there's a space underneath that for entering in the six-month appointment. And this is the only follow-up that we're doing for this particular project, but if you were doing several follow-ups over a longer study, you could put all of those in there, um, all of the windows and all of the actual appointment dates to fill in. So for here, um, once they fill that in, that's going to um, pop up in that left-hand margin, so it'll always be visible, but as they're filling out the demographic data, um, 
that's visible for this particular tab. Um, other things that are possible on this is doing logic checks. Um, we've instituted logic checks that if uh, somebody's, um, somebody is checked off as ineligible to enroll um, and we're interested in knowing why they're ineligible, they are given an error message if they don't fill out why. Um, if they are marked as ineligible to enroll, then they cannot check, check off that they were randomized. So different logic checks like that can be programmed in and are another way of not only preventing um, uh, errors in data entry, but also um, accidents in the actual activities that are going on according to protocol. So I'm going to stop right here because I've been talking for a little bit um, and ask if there are any questions either from the last section or from this section on uh, web design, um, on keeping track of recruitment and retention, or if you just have any comments on something you may have done in the past that was similar to this or very different. And that is star one to ask a question or make a comment. And no one has signaled at this time. All right, so we can move on, but save up. And I'm sorry, pardon the interruption. We did just have someone signal. Oh, great. Go ahead. And your line is open. I was curious, is this program in C4 or something else? Um, this is actually in, I believe it's in um, SQL. Uh, the, we're using our local um, dedicated IT group to do it. I am not a programmer, unfortunately. It's something that I feel like I should have learned at, at this point. Uh, but yes, it can be uh, our, our database is in SQL. Um, and uh, and I believe that that's how they're capturing the data. I'm not really sure about the website if it's um, if it's flat out just HTML or uh, or if they're using another language for it. Thanks. That's great. Thanks. Um, anything else? And again, that is star one to pose a question. And no other signals. Okay. Thank you very much for the question. Everybody else, feel free to jump in whenever. Okay. Moving on, all right, so you want to keep track of recruitment and retention. What do you need to keep track of? What is something that's going to help you with the progression of your study? Um, I'll give you examples, and again, I would welcome other people um, chiming in on things that they're interested in tracking, but um, what do you need daily, weekly? What do you need for your DSMB meetings? What do you need to report for your progress report? And who do you need to report to? You know, as I said before, DSMB, your IRB. Um, if you are a site coordinator or if you are a recruitment coordinator, who are you reporting to? I report to the lead team. I also report to the sites and let them know how they're doing um, and, and if they're uh, falling behind in any place, or if I feel that they can make some more efforts in certain certain places. Um, so you need to write down what do you need to track, um, what's useful for you to to keep track of. Uh, is it just the recruitment numbers? Is it just how many people were screened and found eligible or ineligible? How many of those people who were screened um, and found eligible were randomized, how many of people who were screened and found eligible were not randomized and why, um, how often do you need to keep track of, of demographics, and balancing that with um, what do your sites need? How can sites benefit from tracking? I truly believe that the more services you can offer back to your, your research teams on the ground running, uh, the, the, the more interested and invested they are going to be in filling out this information, um, which may be a redundancy in terms of filling out the source materials as well as uh, uh, filling out outcome data, okay? So one of the ways in which sites can benefit from tracking in this way is, as I pointed out, having uh, follow-up windows, deadlines, um, appointments, uh, 
automatically populate, as well as being able to list incomplete activities, um, you know, where is a participant not complete in their, uh, in their going through the study and all of the activities that are, that are supposed to be done. You know, at a glance you can see, flip through things. Um, and let me move on uh, to the different tracking elements um, that you can actually go through. Um, these, are, again, are just examples, persistent demographics, screening and randomization dates and status, eligibility status. I, I have said several times the calculated windows, the date schedules and deadlines, activity completion. All of those things are, are, are things that can be of interest to somebody in any level or any, um, any area of the teams that are attached to a project. And be, having them available for anybody to benefit from is something that should be of interest, um, especially if you're programming something from scratch. All right, in order to know how to make it useful, um, what I had said about knowing what you need to know, knowing what you need to track, you need to know how often you need to know it. Um, we have certain items that are due every day by close of business. We have certain items that are due every week. Um, so close of business Friday, or if a clinic works over the weekend, close of business whatever is the last day of the week that they're open. Um, and then integrating that into each site's local SOPs. Um, remember when I had said uh, about organizing visually how to break apart the activities of a project, and if there's something flexible like data entry, giving that flexibility into how to schedule what the day is like for RAs and counselors and site coordinators and whoever else is doing data entry, um, work that into the SOP so that you know where in the process is a good time or an available time to put in that data entry. So it might be during recruitment, enrollment baseline, or in multiple points during the day where you can jot in a couple different bits of information or save it for the end of the day and enter it all in there. Save certain things for the end of the week and enter them then. Um, Maybe they don't recruit one day a week. We've got several sites that don't recruit on Fridays, so they save up all the available paperwork that doesn't have to be done immediately, and they do it at the end of the day, but that's part of their SOP at their, um, their local operating procedure at their site. Um, one of the options that they have is entering in everything when they're doing the scheduling for the six-month appointment because at that point it's fairly typical to need to be in front of a computer so you can see a calendar, see the six-month window and the target date for that, um, for that follow-up visit uh, with the participant in front of them so they can do it again. Uh, I'm going to enter in all of your information from your screening questionnaire. Here's the date that I'd like to see you. How close to that date can we make an appointment for you? And boom, everything's entered in that they need to for the day. All right, but that's something, again, is, is unique to each site and each team's needs and comfort level. Some people really need to be able to be quiet and focus when they're doing data entry. And so for them, it's easier at the end of the day to get it all done quicker than it is when the hustle and bustle of a clinic is going on. For some people, it doesn't really matter, and they can do things piecemeal um, as soon as they have a second to sit down. All right, but offering that flexibility and working with sites and working with your teams and your individual team members to find out what's going to be the most efficient for them individually is what's key here, um, as well as what the, t the lead team needs to know at the end of the day, at the end of the week, how feasible that is with how, how much other activity each site needs to do, all right, and making adjustments if it becomes too burdensome. And I've talked about benefiting from, um, from the uh, website and from the centralized database for uh, tracking recruitment. Um, one of these things is building in automatic reports that can be clicked on from a website. Um, things that we're working on for ours are an automatic uh, downloadable Excel sheet, spreadsheet that has the total recruited for each individual person's site. So they can log in and it automatically detects which site they're on uh, or where they're from. 
and then uh, the site coordinators can download the total number of people that are recruited and all of their demographic data and then manipulate it in any way that they want because it's an Excel file. Um, but they can get that up to the minute and find out if they have certain things that they'd like to know or, or split up between, um, between different uh, team members to say, okay, I want you to go over this, look for missing data, go back to the source um, document and fill that information in. Um, they can get things like, uh, an example I put here is screened and, and enrolled but not recruited. So activities whose deadlines have not been met can be made into an automatic report. Um, say, reminder reports, so uh, contact dates that are coming up for reminder phone calls or, or letter mailings that are coming up, um, reports for missed activities such as missed follow-up calls or missed appointments. Um, and again, very important for the six-month follow-up windows, windows that are opening, appointment dates that are coming, windows that are closing in the next week so they become the highest priority. Those can all be fashioned into automatic reports, which is very helpful for saving time on the site end for a site coordinator not to have to calculate that out themselves or gather it from various um, piecemeal lists. All right, so again, the more that you can use a centralized location of information to benefit everybody is the key here as to why it's, why it's really exciting to be able to use uh, the web for this. I'm just, oh, I want to go back um, and open up to any questions. So we were talking about automatic reports, data entry, timing, what types of tracking elements you might want to use. Um, and how you might want to plan on doing tracking. So if anybody has any questions. Star one to pose a question or make a comment. And no one has signaled at this time. Okay, going, going, gone. We're, we're moving on. Here's an example of daily reporting. Um, this is cobbled together from some information uh, with a few, changed, uh, a few changes in it from something that I typically give to the lead team on a daily basis. Um, uh, and this is a, a fancier version of what I've started out from. Um, I started out just doing uh, screened and randomized that day and total screened and total randomized up to date. Um, that would be your simplest thing from each site individually and then adding to across the site. Um, and that's really so up to the minute daily, you know, what's going on with everybody and who's falling behind, who's way ahead, how close are we to our target uh, rate and our, and our target deadline for randomization. I've added into this um, on request of the lead team uh, the total number that were screened that week the number that were randomized both the previous week and this week. Um, and those are all really so that there can be comparisons made. If there's a dip for a week, we can compare, well, you know, is this something that's been consistent without having to look back at all of the reports, or is this something that is new to this week, all right? And uh, then below that is what percentage that each site and the entire project is um, towards being complete with all of the recruitment activities, um, the specific number that's remaining for recruitment, and then uh, dependent upon the, uh, the number, the target number of um, recruiting per week for each site, which we've put at, um, uh, at 18 per week for this particular, uh, particular project, the number of weeks to finish. All right, so that we have a targeted timeline that's constantly fluid, but is clear. All right, and so we can fiddle with that and say, well, do we need to increase their, um, their uh, production levels? Um, is it possible for us to ask each site to, to recruit one more, two more a week, and how far, how far can we get ahead by doing that if we're falling behind or if we launched late, later than we usually did because that's what happens in research is everything takes longer than we think it's going to, even if we plan on it taking longer than we want it to, all right? Um, an example of some information that comes from a weekly report I might put out is 
um, just the number of people that have been approached so I can get an idea of people who even decline screening um, and then the number of people who are screened and how what percentage of people who are being approached are being screened. I mentioned this before. Um, the number of people who are screened to date, so you can compare that to the total. And then, and then those that are eligible to, um, to enroll from the number that are screened and the percentage of that, all right? And then finally, the number of randomized to date. So all of these are different stages in the recruitment process and really understanding, you know, uh, what are the differences between sites. You can see that um, for some sites, uh, there's a really larger, much larger number of people who are willing to be screened at their approach than at other sites. And is that compared to the whole, um, you know, is the larger number more uh, more normal or is the smaller number more normal? And that's something that's really interesting for lead teams to look at because if they start to have to rely on certain sites for making up numbers, that's where they're going to get that information. All right, and again, more information from the weekly report. These are demographic data, um, and this is the same thing I would do for uh, the spread of different races for, say, um, drug use in the past six months or sexual history, anything that um, is something that we need to keep track of for demographics or is uh, particular, particular groups that we need to make sure we get enough of um, because we're, we've got outcome data riding on it. So if we're looking to get um, a good number of injection drug users versus cocaine users, we might want to keep track of that from the screening information on a weekly basis to ensure that we've got a balanced population um, for that, okay? All right, as I said, uh, for site-specific reports, the website should benefit the site team. It should be a reward for the amount of effort that goes into entering data into the system. Um, and again, I've, I've said uh, that site-specific site automatic reports that are useful um, are in tracking time-sensitive tasks, for knowing what appointments are coming up, for knowing if everybody's on track with their activities, whether it's the, uh, the research staff or if it's the participants themselves that are missing activities. Um, and then moving on to retention activities and keeping, uh, keeping up with those sorts of uh, uh, procedures. Um, and I'd like to move into retention tracking from that. Um, this is something that is a lot of effort to put into uh, what should be or may be seen typically by teams as a time to rest between recruitment and actual follow-up. Contrarily, the more effort you put into that supposed rest period, the easier your follow-up rate is going to be to achieve, all right? Um, one of the things that was so successful in our last, um, our last project for CTN, which is number 32, um, in which at one month follow-up, I believe we had a 98% follow-up rate overall, and six months follow-ups, we had a 93 point something, I think it rounded up to 94% percent follow-up rate, which is unheard of. And I absolutely commend, it was all of the site staff, um, the research teams that maintained significant and constant contact with all of their participants to make sure that they didn't lose them, all right? So that, and then at the very end, those people that were really difficult to find, being absolutely rabid in doing everything that they could to find those people. So one of the things to do that is to pre prepare in advance um, for how you're going to keep track of people, particularly difficult populations, who we tend to research. Um, so if you're going to be going after a difficult population, you better be prepared, and you better have some pretty creative ways of maintaining contact with somebody who is really good at getting lost, okay? One of the things that we did was uh, while, we, while we required in the protocol to have two or three official uh, reminder contacts, those were through letters and phone calls, we actually ended up increasing that in local um, site-specific operation manuals to monthly contacts for most of the sites. 
Um, and the way that we prepare the participants for that is to let them know, well, we get in contact with everybody um, once a month or so just to check to see if you're okay and to make sure none of your, uh, none of your information for contacting you has changed, all right? So that they're prepared for it. It's very casual, but it maintains the rapport that you have with that person. It maintains the relationship between the participant and the research staff, all right? Um, Getting participants' locator confirmation uh, is extremely important. Um, making a relationship with the contacts that they have, secondary, tertiary contacts, in case you can't get a hold of the participant, extremely important because that person may be your lifeline to keeping your percentage at retention levels that you need, all right? Um, comments, and what I mean by comments is documentation, such as the comment field on the website. It's any additional information that doesn't fit in anywhere else that um, can help the other staff members or the same staff member at a later date um, continue on with the history of that case. Uh, any clues to help you remember who that person is, because personally, I can't keep 100 people straight in my head, m much less 500. I need clues as to, oh, yeah, this is the one that went to jail a couple of years ago for stealing somebody else's dog, so I need to call his mom because she always sends him cookies every Sunday, and she knows when he's going to get out on parole, so she's promised me that she'll let me know the next time I call. I'm going to have notes on that so that I know what my relationship with that person and what that person's contact is. Because um, frequently once you get to the end of a window period and you're desperate to find somebody, that mother might be the only person you've talked to in five months, and you better make sure that she's your ally, all right? Uh, a recruitment coordinator, someone in my position, um, my job is to help the team strategize, help keep them on track, um, and also, as we go through, bring up reports on, okay, this is your activities this week or this month, uh, these are the individuals that I see you haven't been able to contact yet. What's our strategy for them? So not only keeping them on target, but being available for giving them um, some, some power and some uh, direction as to where do we go from here because the cell phones don't work. And he broke up with his girlfriend and uh, the, the drug treatment team hasn't seen him or won't talk to us okay, well, we're going to move on to finding out what his legal status is, or we're going to um, write to his case counselor at this old shelter that he worked at that he gave us permission to contact. You know, all of these sorts of things is a way to um, keep everybody on track and to really work through what the possibilities are. And it starts off with that clear documentation that I mentioned all throughout, um, but starting at the beginning with the locator information, all right? Another thing that I can do and it is to offer retention quality assurance. I can make sure that those monthly calls are happening, um, that it's not just leaving a phone, phone message or a voicemail message, that they're actually making contact because if they're not, they might be losing somebody because that person might have just left an answering machine on and could be on the street somewhere because it's not even their, their apartment, okay? Uh, so we've got some question space here. Um, and we'll give another uh, half a minute for anybody to come up with any questions that they have on retention tracking. And please press star 1 to ask a question or make a comment. And we'll take our question. Hi, um, I have a specific question. I don't know if you're going to get into this more or not, but I was wondering what kind of resources you use if the participants, like all of the contact information we have for them, all of the locators, if everything is disconnected or wrong numbers. Okay. It's a, it's a really good question. Thank you for asking it. Um, I'm going to move on to the next slide, and uh, I'll pause after this explanation to see if anybody else has any other comments or questions. Um, but we, I was going to go on straight into exactly what you're asking about. So um, uh, one of the things that uh, we like to collect, not only uh, our family and friends, but um, caseworkers, parole officers, um, 
whether they're veterans and if they're receiving services, if they have a veteran number, um, Social Security numbers, driver's, driver's license numbers, things that can help us look them up in the legal system. Um, several uh, states have websites where you can look someone up by name or Social Security number or something like that, where you can find out if they're incarcerated either in a jail or in a federal facility where you can find out if they're on parole or if they've got a court hearing coming up. And you can find out the date of that court hearing and whether or not it happens or whether it's been delayed. That's a good resource. Um, and you'll want to know the shelters in your area and what their, uh, how their setups are, are or what their setups are, you know, can you call and leave a message, will it get to somebody, or is there somebody who works there or volunteers there that's really good at getting messages to people who live there. Um, when I go, when I train people to go through and fill out locator information, I tell them, your participant knows themselves. They know, you know, they know their own patterns. If they disappear, where are they? Are they, are they in a particular hole? Um, in a bad part of town, and how long is it going to take to get them out of there? Where do they go when they come back to the surface? Um, if I can't get a hold of you and your mom doesn't know who, where you are and you've broken up with your girlfriend again and your cell phone isn't working, how long is it going to take you to recharge your cell phone and, and pay for more minutes? Um, or who do I call and where do I go to find you? Okay? They know themselves. They know what rounds they go through. All right? Um, you can ask how, how transient are their social circles as well as how transient they are. So are these long-term friends or do you go from group to group depending on whether you're using or not? Who's somebody who's known you for a while who you always get back to to let them know you're okay? Which is why I frequently say mom because that, that a lot of times that is. Or maybe it's, you know, uh, an, a significant other that they've had an on-again, off-again relationship with, but that's somebody who they trust to keep hold of their stuff while they're in a bad situation, all right, be that homeless or using or jail or drug treatment, all right? Do they always go back to the same um, social services facilities when they're ready to get back to being um, in that part of their lives? Write down that information on a locator form. Ask them, you know, uh, every time you make that contact with them, and this is why having frequent contact during the retention period between visits is so important, is because you can say, okay, this is the information we have from you now. Are you going to be still living at that address? Is your phone still going to be that the next time we call? And they say, oh, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I just lost my job, so I'm not really sure if I'm going to be able to pay for the minutes. Okay, well, how do we get in touch with you um, if that happens next month? Or, you know, can you come in and uh, let us know um, on a weekly basis if you're okay so that we know where you are? Or always come in if you lose your appointment card or it gets stolen because you're in a shelter. Um, come in and get another one. Let us know you're okay. Keep that relationship going, but also say, you know, uh, acknowledge we know it's realistic that you might not be where you think you are um, a week from now or a month from now. So given your knowledge of yourself, how can you help us find you? All right? Any other questions on that? Star one to pose a question. And no one has signaled. Okay, so I'm going to move on, um, and this is really just sort of summing up what I was what I was what I was talking about. Is the harder somebody is to reach, the more touch points they need. And if you're an RA or a counselor, if you've worked in um, in research for a while with tough to reach populations, you do have an instinct for how squirrely somebody can be. All right, trust your instincts on that. Get the most information on a consistent basis, but for the people who are kind of shifty or maybe have some special problems, perhaps they've got some mental health problems that make it more difficult for them to remember certain things. So you might say, you know, do you have somebody in your life who helps keep you um, aware of what appointments you are, who goes to the doctor with you? And if that person is, uh, if there is that kind of person, say, well, 
is it okay if we call that person and remind them as well of your appointment coming up? Or do we have permission to do that? And can we give you an extra appointment card so you can give that person an appointment card as well so they know where you're supposed to be? Um, if they are, you know, just, just your average, uh, maybe not very reliable kind of person, um, you could offer an incentive as a barrier reduction. Um, if you come in uh, between now and your follow-up appointment, um, halfway through in three months, if you come in and, t and verify all of your locator information with us, we'll, we'll give you an extra five or ten dollars. All right, something like that that gives them an incentive um, to keep in touch with you. All right, uh, again, finding out what their patterns are, what their drift back points are, um, who's the person you always go back to, how often do you relapse, where do you seek treatment. How often do you get incarcerated, and at what level of incarceration do you get locked up? Is it, are you in the drunk tank? Are you drying out? Are you um, put in the county jail for a few weeks for, uh, for fencing something or for, for hooking? Are you typically uh, put in federal prison? Is that something like that's a yearly or a many year cycle for you? Um, you know, how do we get in touch with you if you have done that? All right, and if you know those points and you know that those are points that are going to be coming up with a certain population, then you can prepare your team ahead of time and prepare your, uh, your site's local um, operations manual for dealing with that. So if you know that you're going to need to have legal status information, you're going to want to know um, What's the procedure for getting in touch with a person of authority over visitors to each, uh, each legal, uh, each penal facility in your area? Is that something that your IRB allows? Are you allowed to work with prisoners, all right, um, or not? Are you allowed to visit, or can you only do it over the phone? Are you allowed to bring in a laptop so that they can do a computerized assessment, or do you need to do hard copies? And is that something that you can get passed through your IRB, or do you need to get it passed through your IRB, okay? Um, if you're not allowed to, uh, to have contact with prisoners, are there other ways of, um, of completing a follow-up? If they're going to be getting out a week after their window closes, can you take the, the violation and allow a site to complete that outside of the window so that you still have the data? And if you have the data, you can, you can end up using it or not using it, but you'll have it, all right? Same thing with shelter, treatment facilities, anything else that, um, that's not a home is something that you need to consider. You need to know its structure. You need to know what it, that it exists and its location. Um, you need to know what their policies are in terms of allowing outside people in or in terms of passing on information. Um, if it, a drug treatment facility may not have uh, any contact with the outside world allowed for the first 21 days, you'll need to know that um, and be able to, and, and know that you have permission from the participant to contact somebody, a caseworker at any one of those places or to send a letter, all right? and have them contact you and keep on trying, making sure that you're keeping copious notes and saying, okay, they're at this place. The SOP that, that's for our site says that we have this contact at this prison. Um, these are the steps that we've gone through already, so now we need to fax something by letterhead to the warden saying that we need access to, you know, such and such prisoner for, um, uh, for a follow-up appointment. All right, and we need to get on that now because this takes this amount of time to get through, and we want to make sure that we have access before their window period is up. All right, having this stuff in place, knowing what the procedures are in order to approach these, these difficult situations can make the difference between losing all of your incarcerated patients or all of your drug treatment patients and maintaining a good percentage of them that will bring a significant retention percentage up. All right, any questions there? Star one for questions. And there are no signals. 
Okay, so we'll move on. All right. What I like to get at and remind people is um, with follow-through and retention is that uh, your study is not your participant's priority, it's yours. They don't care. It's not their business to care. Um, but what they do care about is any sort of benefit it can be to them. And that benefit may be the money that they get. It might be the services they get through being part of the study. Um, so they might be getting special test results that they couldn't afford before. They might be getting some counseling. They might be, uh, they might be getting some personal contact and care, and that's important to them. All right. They might be getting hooked up with other services, housing, uh, medical treatment, mental health, dental, anything that's attached to your study. So keep in mind that that's what's benefiting them, not the purpose and the, and the, the golden rule of research that we all love and that, that's our purpose. Okay, so keep that in mind. Know your individual participants. Um, like I said, keep an eye on who's extra squirrely or has particular difficulties um, and make sure that you build a case file that keeps track of those people so that anybody who comes up with that case file will be able to know, does that person need an extra phone call a month? Do they need to be reminded every single day for a week before their appointment because they've got a really hectic life or, you know, they've got childcare issues that they need to really uh, keep at to make sure that they're consistent and that that, that, that doesn't fall through uh, or they've got mental health issues and having that reminder is absolutely necessary because they won't remember. Do they need help with transportation? Um, that sort of extra attention is something you need to really build in either on an individual level or sometimes it's, it's on a population-wide level, all right? Keep in constant communication with them. Build and maintain that relationship. Let them know that you're thinking about them and that they're important to you because they're part of the study, but also because you know them. And that, again, is why we keep a case file and why we keep uh, copious notes so that we can remember each person as an individual. Help them to trust us. Help them to like us, all right, and help them to be our allies. And I said that before I said with their contacts because it means the same thing with the participants as it does with their locator contact. All of those people, we need to make the effort for them to actually want to help us because otherwise we're just another part of the, the system that can be hurtful and harmful to particularly downtrodden um, populations and those tend to be the people that we want to work with, okay? So we need to make those efforts to build and maintain trust, to build and maintain um, relationships, all right? And how we do that is through showing and doing and paying attention to what their needs are. Okay. So I, I mentioned a little while back about um, adherence drift, that towards the end of a study, um, it's pretty common for us to get a little lax about protocol, to think that we know it all, um, to have developed bad manners or bad, bad habits, to let things slide. Um, having reports, and by reports I mean keeping track of which activities have been completed on time and which haven't, uh, keeping notes um, and reading through them regularly to see uh, what sorts of patterns are going on, um, either with participants, with the study overall, or with individual people on a, on a team can help to identify stuff like that. We have QA monitors that identify developing problems, but we need to support them, okay, in other areas because there's only so much that they can do with just paper documentation, okay? Um, having staff meetings regularly comes back to communication. Know what the morale of your staff is. Know what the morale of the entire team and project is. Keep communication going so that you can address complaints, you can address frustrations, and even if there isn't a, a way to solve those, those issues, being heard can sometimes be enough. Commiserating can sometimes be enough, so we need to also have a good relationship with everybody on our team, okay? Keeping uh, communication going between different 
different teams is nice because teams tend to get isolated from each other in the middle of a project, and it's really difficult to speak up if you're on a national phone call with 160 people and all the lead PIs are talking, and you feel that you're on the lowest rung of the of the hierarchy ladder um, of the totem pole to say, you know, well, gee, I had this experience last week and it sucked. You know, it's not the time to do it. But opening up lines of communication on different levels so that um, so that everybody has a chance to really share their experiences can not only help strengthen the team, strengthen the project as a whole, but it can also bring forth ideas and solutions and problems that perhaps might not be seen otherwise, okay? Um, making sure that you meet with uh, the clinic staff or whatever site environment you're in to, if they're helping you with certain parts of a protocol, to make sure that they're not drifting from the protocol adherence, that they're not forgetting to do what they agreed to do in the beginning. And that's at that point where, you know, meeting with um, whoever's organizing scheduling and space allotment, hey, you know, remember how in the beginning when we came here you agreed that my staff would be able to use rooms A, B, and C for this amount of time. That's not happening. Can you help me out so that we can remind people that that was the agreement? Or if your scheduling has changed or your staffing has changed, we need to meet again team to team or director to director and rethink and reallocate space so that everybody has what they need. All right? Or uh, bringing the director down and the PI down after talking and saying, okay, we know this is difficult for everybody, but we want to remember, we want everybody to re remember we made an agreement to work with, that, with these people and part of their funding is going to us and helping us. So let's make sure that we understand, well, why is this difficult for the clinic staff to follow through with? How can we make it easier? And then let's agree to try harder, okay? So that's part of prevention, part of uh, working together to, um, to reduce the barriers to keeping protocol from drifting, all right? And then refinement. Um, manuals of procedure are constantly changing. We know this because we've all done the, uh, the amendment submissions um, again and again and again. And it happens and you just accept it. Um, but to really look at the MOP as an actively refined tool, a fluid tool that constantly has ongoing modifications um, to clarify unforeseen circumstances or to clarify existing um, procedures that may have seemed clear when they were being first described but actually require more breakdown so that uh, if somebody loses their place or, or starts to slide in how they're doing it, they can go back to it and really use it as a resource document. Consistently encourage all of your staff to use things like this as a resource document, to use it as their encyclopedia first, and then if it doesn't make sense, point that out to somebody and say, if you can't explain this to me, we need to bring this to another level or to another meeting and say it doesn't make sense. We need to either refine it or clarify it more, all right? So understanding that, helping everybody on your staff understand that it's it's something that's expected to know, you're expected to know and expected to use. If you don't know how to do something, you're expected to reuse it periodically to make sure that you know how to how to go through the protocol accurately and in the right direction. And then finally, retraining is a way of refinement. All right, not only to clarify certain protocols and procedures that may have drifted over time or may have had reinterpretations, but also to bring everybody back. And any profession, everybody needs to go through periodic retraining of their basic skills, all right, um, because we forget and we make shortcuts and we bring in uh, past behaviors, particularly if we were working in another field. So. Retraining helps bring back everybody so that they're still doing the same thing and maintains consistency in the project, which is extremely important. Uh, just explaining that, no, it's not that you're doing anything wrong, unless you are, um, but everybody needs to go through this because we need to make sure that what we're doing here is worth something, all right? 
Um, so we've got a big fat red question mark. Are there any questions there? Or any comments, actually? Star one to pose a question or make a comment. And there are no signals at this time. Okay. So uh, that actually was the end of the presentation. Um, I am I'm going to stay on the line if if anybody wanted to wait till the end to to do any discussion. Um, I'm also available by email, uh, and, um, which I don't know if that was available anywhere else. But I believe my email is, is uh, entered in um, in my profile on the webinar. Um, it's also lhall2 at med.miami.edu, so if you'd like to ask me any questions or if you'd like some examples of some of the um, uh, tools that I've used, I'd be happy to help anybody out, either over the phone or email. Um, and thank everybody again for attending. It's, it's been pretty exciting for me to do this for the first time. So. Um, Star one for any questions, I guess, for just a couple minutes, and then we'll end this. And okay? we do have a question. Hi. Nice presentation. Um, hi. Hi. I had a question. Um, I had two questions. You can say, answer them for you want. Um, one is, uh, do you incentivize individual staff, um, research assistant staff in any way, follow the person you're talking about. And the second one was sort of a technical question. Are sort of client progress notes in an adverse event database as opposed to sort of these kind of contact um, notes that you keep as part of your locator? So I'm just curious how your AE database relates to these other databases. Okay. Thank you. Um, let me... Uh Address the first one. You said in terms of uh, incentivizing staff members, correct? Um, I have not done that. Um, I wouldn't argue with it. Uh, we have um, we've in the past offered um, sort of nominations for uh, for star of the month for a project, um, and it would be up to um, the the PIs if they wanted to do, say, gift certificate or, or something, but we've put people's names in the, um, in the CTN bulletin. I don't know if anybody's seen that. Um, just to give people individual recognition, because it's, it's pretty common for somebody who works on a research staff who isn't involved in the higher-up planning of grants and of publications to really not get a whole lot of recognition. So I think it's a really great idea. Um, I, I think it, it can sometimes be a little depressing to feel like you do a lot of the grunt work, and um, it's nice to be recognized that way on a national level to people you don't even know. So you get to be, you know, feel famous for a day. Um, so I like that idea, uh, and um, and that can be in terms of, you know, on an individual level, or maybe saying. Um, Let's get a little competitive and offer a uh, pizza party to the site that does the best, like, percentage of, um, of their target this month or something like that. All right. And then you asked about the adverse events database. That's not something I'm actually involved in. Um, I'm not an official data manager, nor am I in, um, part of uh, – uh, quality assurance officially for CTN. Um, so I'm going to ask Liz, do you have any sort of comment on that? I don't, but I can take it down and follow up on it. Okay, please do, yes. And I'm sorry that I couldn't answer that uh, directly over the phone. Is there anybody else who had a, a question or a comment that they'd like to make? And star one, the signal. And no signals at this time. All okay. right. Hey, um, Laura, let me give a couple post training um, updates. We will be sending out a communication to everybody, and it will include a webinar evaluation. And as part of that um, email, I will provide Laurel's uh, personal contact information. Recordings will be available of today's seminar. We'll have it available in the dissemination library, on live link, 
and an inventory of CDs will be provided to all the node coordinators for, fur for further uh, node distribution. If you'd like to have uh, recordings sent individually to you, send your request to ebuytree at ms.com, <coughs> excuse me, or to ctntraining at ms.com. Laurel, I want to thank you for presenting today. Developing this training with you has been an absolute joy, and it was a great opportunity for you to share this information with everybody in the network. Thanks very well, thank much. Thank you. It's a joy for me, too. Thanks again. And uh, I will speak with some of you later and some of you not at all, but thank you again. Thanks very much. Thanks, everybody. This concludes today's session. Have a great afternoon. That concludes today's program. Thank you for your participation.